so uh, everybody can hear me. So uh, I, I was asked, or uh, I will uh, talk about uh, topological phases of matter uh, that uh, can be, uh, so topological insulators and the classification of topological insulators. And uh, so it will be a set of uh, topological, uh, a set of pedagogical talks on, on, on this. And so uh, I, uh, I, I haven't prepared a careful uh, set of references, uh, so but I guess I'll post something uh, which I haven't yet, uh, lecture notes and so on, and there will be more details on on references, and uh, so the the perhaps the most recent reference of this on this is uh, on the archive. Uh, December last year. Uh, and it's also called uh, published. And uh, so in a way that that contains a, a, a lot of uh, the material I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, uh, first. So I like a So, classification of topologic insulators and superconductors. So, let me start uh, by saying things that are probably well known. Uh, so, uh, topologic phases of matter uh, can be uh, subdivided into uh, at least two categories. Uh, topologic phases with intrinsic topological order. So examples are fractional quantum Hall states. And so these systems uh, have uh, ground state degeneracies uh, when you put the system on a space that is topological non-trivial and have uh, anionic excitations, which have fractional quantum numbers and uh, non-trivial Bray statistics and so on. Uh, so that's one class. And the other class is uh, symmetry protected uh, topological phases, which have none of the above. Uh, but uh, the ground states cannot be deformed into their product state uh, while keeping all the symmetries intact unless uh, you undergo a quantum phase transition. Uh, so uh, the symmetries uh, may not be uh, very big symmetries, uh, just uh, to make the point, they may not be very large symmetry groups. For example, uh, there is the uh, 2D, 2 plus 1D, P plus IP uh, superconductor that has probably appeared 
in the lectures uh, before. And uh, this one has a very small symmetry group. So the symmetry group G uh, that protects this face is just uh, fermion parity, which is uh, Z2. So it's a very small group. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I'd like to just uh, just subdivide roughly uh, the topological phases into those that have intrinsic topological order and that don't. That's all I want to do, right? Yeah, but the complement of one is uh, Yeah, maybe there are other phases, but uh, so maybe they're not strictly subdivided, but this is a rough division, right? So that's what I want to say. And I will talk about uh, uh, this kind of phase. Uh, in, in his lecture, versions of these phases, and not about the others that have intrinsic topological order and so on. Right? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, right. So all I want to say is I, I'd like to talk about versions of symmetry protected phases, which are phases that have no anions. And those have the property that the ground states, so they're still non-trivial, as long as preserve symmetry, you cannot adiabatically continue the system uh, into a system where the ground state is just a direct product state. Right? So that's what I'm saying. And I'm like, I like to talk about special versions of these. So that's when I'm coming down from there. So, uh, so the big problem in, in this class of systems is to produce some kind of classification to, to learn about all of them. And uh, so, So topological insulators and superconductors of uh, non-interacting fermions are really the simplest uh, SPT phases. And I guess the reason why I'm here is you can completely uh, classify them in any dimension of space. And I'll, I'll, uh, so that's what these lectures are about. And uh, so, of course, more generally, uh, SPT phases are, in a way, uh, minimal uh, generalizations of these non-interacting uh, fermion SPTs, fermion uh, topological insulators to include interactions. And so uh, more general, our fermion SPTs with interactions. And uh, so today we, we don't fully understand how to classify those, but uh, the the non so whatever we understand, in a way, is built on the template of of the non-interacting classification, and so that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so. Uh, the simplest and, uh, if you want, most fundamental classification scheme for these topological and superconductors applies to systems uh, 
which have a property uh, that, so no symmetries, uh, that are unitarily realized on a single particle Hilbert space are required to protect the SPT. So that's maybe a definition that uh, you, you haven't heard in uh, that much detail. So we look at systems of uh, topological insulators, superconductors, non-interacting fermions. And uh, these are non-interacting systems, which have a property that no symmetries that are unitarily realized on a single particle Hilbert space are required to protect uh, the topological phase. And so I will el elaborate on this uh, below. So just to be clear, uh, unitarity realized symmetries or examples or translations, translation variance, uh, any crystal symmetry, crystal lattice symmetry reflections, and so reflections and so on. So for example, SU2 spin rotations. So if a system with Pauli spin and it has SU2 symmetry. So all these, uh, all these symmetries are uh, unitarily uh, realized. Uh, so it's of course possible to, to ask what classification uh, results uh, uh, if, if we also require unitarily realized symmetries on the Hilbert space to protect the topological phase. Uh, so we can do that. And uh, however, uh, the answer to this question will not be as universal as the answer to this question. Uh, because obviously, you have to specify which symmetry group which is unitarily realized uh, on a single particle Hilbert space, uh, you, you want to use to protect the SPT. And so, of course, uh, in bosonic SPTs, the group cohomology approach addresses this question. And so, and there also exists uh, a generalization of the group cohomology approach uh, to fermionic systems which uh, is group supercomology and is currently being explored. Uh, but I, I, want I would like to ask the most, uh, uh, the most universal uh, question, which is this one, that I don't want to require any unitarily re realized symmetry on a single particle with space uh, that is necessary to protect the topological, the SPT. Um, so in a way, this is uh, the most universal uh, question we can ask. Yeah. Pardon me? Yeah, I will be. Uh, that's a good question. So I will elaborate on this on on this notion uh, in 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 the sequel, right? Indeed, indeed. So we we're talking about non-interacting fermions, 
And so uh, we can talk about the Hilbert space in first quantization, the first quantized Hilbert space. And uh, the question we're addressing here is we are asking about uh, symmetries that are realized, how they are realized on a, on a Hilbert space of first quantization. And there we can, uh, so I'll be explicit later, uh, more explicit, the symmetries can be unitary or non-unitary, anti-unitary. And so the classification I will be discussing, which as I argue is the most fundamental one, uh, does, not, does, does not require any symmetries to protect the SPT that are unitarily realized, only not anti-linear, anti-unitary, right? Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. So translation symmetry is a special case, obviously, of a unitarily realized symmetry. And I will not, so this classification will not be talking about SPTs of non-interactive fermions that require translation symmetry. It may change, yes. Right. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that will come out, and it's not obvious. And so before you think about it more deeply, it's maybe not obvious, because you may think that uh, just as there's a vast reservoir of unitarily realized symmetries, there's a vast reservoir of non-unitarily realized symmetry. But that's not true. There are actually only a few. And that's the reason why this is a very successful way of thinking. Right? So I'll come to that later. Right. So one, yeah. Does it matter if it's discrete space or, not, or continuous space and discrete time or continuous time? Uh, I will always use continuous time, uh, but I think none of much of that will change. But I haven't thought about that deeply. I know there's an issue of floquet right. uh, uh, systems, and I haven't thought about too deeply about that. But I, I think it's not doesn't matter so right. much, discrete right? Space that shouldn't matter, no. Yeah. Indeed. So that I will uh, write down something that is equivalent to that, uh, right? Well, I would say it's it's the first problem we should understand. Once we understand this, we can always add unitary symmetries to protect the SPT, and we get a slightly more complicated uh, classification. And for each each symmetry group. Each symmetry group that is unitarily realized, we have to solve a new problem, right? But here we don't have to solve, we have to still solve one problem. Not. Okay, if you want it, right, right, right. Right, right, right. That's one way of thinking, okay? Uh, are there more questions? So, uh, so once once we agree that with this, uh, we we like to focus on this one. Uh, we'd like to uh, uh, get a full classification. So we get we like to understand all all cases. So somehow, in order to get uh, exhaustive classification. Uh, we somehow, that incorporates all cases. Uh, we need to uh, have a framework uh, to describe all possible 
Hamiltonians in some way. And uh, since we talk about systems uh, that are single particle systems uh, without interactions, uh, we need a framework to write down, in some sense, all possible single particle Hamiltonians without, without missing one. So, and, at late, and then we decide uh, how, how we classify them. And so that uh, framework uh, is uh, called uh, the tenfold way. Uh, which I'll explain now uh, what, what it is. I'll review this. So you should think about it as just a, a convenient way to, listing all po to list all possible Hamiltonians. So even if we don't require unitarily realized symmetries to protect the topological phase, so unitarily realized symmetries, uh, uh, even though they require protect the SPT, uh, may always be. Symmetry, uh, but of course, uh, what we can do is uh, we can always, uh, if that's the case, so if a symmetry uh, that is unitary realized, a single particle with space, we can always block diagonalize uh, the Hamiltonian and. Then in each block, uh, there, there's no memory anymore uh, of the symmetry. And uh, so we will be, I'll, I'll write this down in more detail. And so then whatever uh, topological properties the system has will have to come uh, from, from these blocks. And uh, so if you think, so the key, to understand this is to think about the structure of these blocks. So I, I will be more explicit. I'll write down more equations. And uh, so these block Hamiltonians have to be uh, in a way very general. And uh, they don't have much structure because they don't depend anymore on the symmetry. And all they can have, they can have certain reality condition, it turns out. So they can be complex or real or something like that. And these conditions can be thought of in terms of time reversal and uh, charge conjugation symmetry. And so I'll, I'll write down uh, more explicitly uh, what, what this means. And so it turns out, once we think about this, uh, there's only 10 possible uh, types of block Hamiltonians. And so it may not be very obvious why there are exactly 10. And so I'll uh, explain that. And I'll be more uh, specific now. So. So first, let's think about uh, the second quantized Hamiltonian. So it's uh, and so uh, that addresses your question. So what we'll do, we'll regularize a system in position space 
on some kind of lattice. And so uh, A and B or I and J label lattice sites. And uh, they go from 1 to N. But maybe you have Pauli spin and then A and B are uh, I Pauli spin, J Pauli spin primed. So your lattice sites with spin, uh, then N, N is twice the number of lattice sites. And so H, so this is a second quantized Hamiltonian, and uh, this is the first quantized Hamiltonian, which is just an n by n matrix of numbers. And so obviously, we're interested in systems where the number of lattice sites is large. Eventually, we're interested in the thermodynamic limit. So sometimes uh, we like to write it this way. So we can write a vector, column vector of operators, uh, row vector of operators, and then okay, second quantized h is psi dagger h. Psi, column vector matrix or a vector. So let's talk about uh, the unitarily realized symmetries. So unitarily realized symmetries means there is a group of symmetries. And uh, there is n by n unitary matrices u, which are really a unitary representation of the group. Uh, and these matrices commute with a Hamiltonian. So this is a first quantized Hamiltonian, which is just this matrix. So let me briefly recast this in second quantized language, which is uh, not very difficult, but let me just write the formula. So in second quantized languages means there's some operator uh, acting on the Fox space of uh, fermions, uh, which does the usual things. So let me write it down. U, U dagger is a Uh, where 
this uh, matrix U and U dagger is just the uh, matrix uh, that appeared above. And then uh, the fact the system is invariant under that symmetry just means uh, that. So this condition is, of course, equivalent to that condition. All right. Uh, so, so far, nothing has happened. Uh, So in this situation, uh, uh, the n-dimensional single particle Hilbert space, let's give it some name. Uh, and so of course, this is spanned. By, you know, so it's a Fock vacuum, which is annihilated by all the size. So that's a single particle Hilbert space. All creation operators acting on the vacuum. And uh, so this n dimensional Hilbert space somehow decomposes under the action of uh, the realiza unitary realization of a group, G0, into irreducible components. So the single particle Hilbert space decomposes. into so is a sum over some lambda certain irreducible representation of a symmetry group and uh, and there's some new lambda And so each, uh, so there's a key statement, which is just quantum mechanics. In each irreducible component, nu lambda can choose, if you want, an orthonormal basis uh, uh, of the form. And the form is, uh, so once I've written down, it maybe sounds more complicated than it is. Uh, so it's a tensor product of basis vectors and uh, So you know this, it's just quantum mechanics. Just let me write it out. So here, uh, K is an index that goes from one to the dimension of the re irreducible representation lambda. So that's what k is. And uh, alpha 1 through m lambda. And this is the multiplicity with which lambda appears 
in the space. So each given irreducible representation, let's say uh, the symmetry group is SU2, spin one half can appear a bunch of times, and m lambda is the multiplicity uh, uh, that the spin one half, lambda equals one half, appears in, in the vector space. And so the key statement now is that G naught acts uh, only on one factor, W, K, and uh, the Hamiltonian leaves that invariance in acts only on uh, the V's. All right. So the stuff where G naught acts on is pure group theory, some Klebsch chord some, uh, some uh, group theory stuff. And that's what we're interested in. Uh, it completely separates the action of the Hamiltonian. And if you want, uh, thus, uh, each lambda, each irreducible, irreducible representation, defines a, a block Hamiltonian Uh, H lambda, which is a uh, M lambda times M lambda matrix, and it, is eigen it has uh, matrix elements H lambda, alpha, beta is H, it's uh, V lambda, V lambda. Uh, alpha, beta. So that's what uh, I mean by blocks. And uh, questions about this? Well, this is just uh, a group theory. Somehow it has to decompose, and also I'm saying at this point, right? It just decomposes in some representation. What we do with them later, we can discuss. It's what? No, it's the other thing. So G naught acts on W. So, so uh, these. So if I take a group element in the group, and then I can have a matrix element of the representation in the Ws, and that's just the representation matrix. I'm not saying anything like that at this point. Uh, it's just group theory at this point. Right? So it's a very general thing, right? obviously. All right. And so now, given that, we can ask the question. Uh, so let's impose some symmetry group, G naught. So now we can ask the question, fix G naught, uh, and consider all single particle Hamiltonians uh, commuting Uh, 
with uh, all symmetry operations in G naught that are unitarily realized on a single particle Hilbert space. So now, so first of all, we fix this. And then we can ask as we run uh, through all these Hamiltonians that are invariant under the unitarily realized symmetries uh, as we run. through these uh, Hamiltonians what if you want sets do the blocks H lambda run through that is if we look at all these single particle Hamiltonians that commute uh, with the symmetry G naught realized on a single particle bit space, then we can do this decomposition into blocks. We get these block Hamiltonians. And we can ask, well, can we say anything about these block Hamiltonians? What Hamiltonians are these? What kind of Hamiltonians are these blocks? And uh, so there's an interesting question. Uh, there's an interesting answer to this question. So uh, the re resulting set of uh, block Hamiltonians H lambda uh, is actually independent of G naught. And uh, basically independent of the representation. And so that's not obvious. And uh, the reason why this is interesting is because we can say something about these block Hamiltonians in this very general setting. And that's what uh, the topic, a uh, tenfold way, that I'm currently discussing is about. So this is fact, which is maybe not obvious, kind of remarkable. Uh, there's only 10 possible such uh, sets of matrices H lambda. And uh, so I list the result. Uh, shortly. So a complete set, so of corresponding
time revolution operators. So, uh, so, so we exponentiate. We have quantum mechanics, so we exponentiate these blocks, and we get. Uh, some unitary matrices. And these are not arbitrary unitary matrices, but kind of special unitary matrices of some sort. And they're listed in the table that I'll turn on now. Unfortunately, I think the uh, projector will come down here. So you have to remember what we're doing. Is there some pointer somewhere? Yeah. No. OK. Mechanical. <laughs> OK. Yeah, or mechanical. So, so here, here are these. Uh, okay. <laughs> here are the time evolution operators, and uh, so don't look at anything else now. Uh, just look at those, and uh, these are certain kind of matrices, and what kind of matrices they are. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, nine, ten. And so all we need to like to point out, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'll explain more later in more detail what these are. Uh, but there's only ten, ten possible types of matrices uh, these uh, time evolution operators can uh, take on. And uh, so uh, that's a result. And I'll be uh, talking about that uh, now in slightly more detail. Uh, yeah? Now, no, no, different blocks may belong to different classes, but these are the only blocks. So each block must be of, of one of these types. And so, It's more complicated, yeah. So, right. So, this is really somehow about quantum mechanics. We should have learned this in the first course on quantum mechanics, but we may have not have. So, it's all only quantum mechanics, nothing, nothing else. So, universality of some sort comes about. Uh, because in principle, in the world of quantum mechanics, there are many, many Hamiltonians, many, many time evolution operators. But the statement is, once I sort of mod out by unitarily realized symmetries, which means I go to these blocks, uh, the Hamiltonians can be much less rich. And there's only uh, 10, 10 possibilities. And so, uh, so why is this useful? Yeah, yeah, I, I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah. These are some kind of matrices, right? So well, it looks like the first row and second row are the same kind of matrix. Kind of right. So I'll, I'll explain, for example, what be the difference between the first and the second one is, right? So uh, I'll, I'll come to that later. But uh, so, so let's think about it following. Uh, the first 
uh, row there is just u. U is a unitary matrix, some kind of unitary matrix. It may be restricted by locality, uh, but uh, it's just a unitary matrix. So uh, the second one is what is known as a coset, uh, is the unitary matrices modded about by the orthogonal matrices. But it turns out we can think about that, and I'll uh, write this down in more detail later. It's an ex it's a exponential of e to the i t h, uh, where h is a is a symmetric Hamiltonian as opposed to an arbitrary Hermitian Hamiltonian. That's not obvious at this point, but I'll talk about that. So a symmetric Hamiltonian comes when I impose time reversal symmetry. So when I impose time reversal symmetry, which is this what it's about, I'll explain that also. Uh, then I can choose a basis where the single particle Hamiltonian is a, is a symmetric matrix. And uh, exponentials of e to the i th, where h is a symmetric matrix, can be written in this way, which is maybe not obvious, but I'll explain that. So the on is like your basis change? Yeah, if you want. Right. Questions? So the other column, I'm yeah. Uh, those are small n's. Is that a replica n? Yeah, OK. So I'll talk about that for people who know too much. <laughs> So th there is another version of these, which are permutation of those. And n is a replica index, or the, uh, the part of the, uh, uh, of the compact bosonic manifold, Anderson localization. But, uh, so I, I, will, I haven't uh, touched on this yet. So, uh, so why is this useful? Uh, it's useful because now, uh, the problem of listing all possible Hamiltonians, and here I mean the single particle Hamiltonians, n by n matrices, uh, the problem uh, which is all blocks uh, has been made. a finite problem. So we have a finite list of possible quantum mechanical Hamiltonians. And then with this list in hand, we can ask the question, well, if uh, I now want these to be topological, are there which ones can be topological, which ones cannot be, and so on. But I have a starting point. And that's why uh, the, the tenfold way uh, method is, is, is useful as a starting point to talk about a classification of topological insulators. And it's, uh, it's, uh, all this is independent of what a unitarily realized symmetry the Hamiltonian is actually invariant under. So we can ask now, a deeper question, uh, what is behind this result? So we know uh, that, that any symmetry in quantum mechanics Uh, must either be realized uh, on the Hilbert space uh, by a unitary or an anti-unitary operator. That's uh, the the Wigner uh, the, the von Neumann uh, theorem. And so currently, what we've done, uh, we have already exhausted uh, the behavior of the Hamiltonian under uh, unitarily realized uh, symmetries. And so, the, so that gives us the blocks. So now when we look at the blocks, uh, the structure of the blocks 
can only depend on the other types uh, of symmetry, namely the anti-unitarily realized symmetries. And uh, so blocks can only depend on those. And now you may worry that there's a vast number of anti-unitarily realized symmetries in quantum mechanics, but it turns out uh, that is incorrect. There is only very few anti unitarily realized symmetries in quantum mechanics and uh, modulo unitary ones. And so I'll be explicit. I'll write equations for the statement later. And so since there's only very few symmetries that are left over once I've taken care of all the unitarily realized ones, I don't have a problem that is too complicated anymore. I get a finite problem. And uh, that's uh, where this table comes from. So, uh, so in a way, that's the outline of uh, the more detailed discussion uh, we'll have now in understanding this uh, uh, more closely. Any questions about this? So, so let's talk about uh, the anti-unitarily realized symmetries. And there, there's one which we're very familiar with, uh, which is time reversal. And so let's uh, talk about uh, time reversal first. Uh, so uh, I will always now uh, keep track of implementations of the symmetries both in a many-body Hilbert space, which is a Fox space, a fermions, and on the single-particle Hilbert space, which is just the uh, Hilbert space of single-particle quantum mechanics. And that's important because there's uh, important differences uh, between these two pictures. Oh. So, uh, so in second quantization, there's an operator that implements time reversal symmetry, which I denote by tau hat. And uh, so a convenient definition is to let it, to define its action, uh, its action on creation formula on, and creation and annihilation operators. And uh, then we know how it acts in second quantization. So, so remember, Indices A and B run from 1 through n. The number of lattice or twice the number of lattice if they're parallel spin. And uh, time reversal is a anti-unitary operation
so uh, ut is an n by n unitary uh, matrix. And the presence of this unitary means that the, the new operators, new creation, the time reversed uh, creation relation operators will satisfy again canonical commutation relations, the same that they did before acting with uh, time reversal symmetry. So now uh, the second quantized Hamiltonian is invariant. Second quantized Hamiltonian written in terms of creation relation operators is invariant is time reversal invariant if and only if, uh, well, it's invariant under the action of uh, time reversal acts by conjugation. So now, yeah. Oh. There should be a tau. There should be, there's an inverse and there should be an inverse. Thanks. There's always typos on the board. Thanks for. So the group can be, uh, the time also can the central tau of the lattice. Yeah, let's, uh, let, okay, we, let's, yeah. So there may be some subtleties uh, which can, we can come to that, right. But let's just, uh, so right now we just discussed time reversal. Uh, operate. We just define it, right? All right. Uh, so, and we can check now what this implies for the first quantized Hamiltonian, which is an exercise, uh, which uh, if you haven't done, you can do. So uh, we can check this is equivalent to the following statement on the first quantized Hamiltonian, which is the n by n matrix. I take all its matrix elements, complex conjugates, and then uh, h star is equal to h potentially upon rotation by the unitary matrix. Uh, and, uh, where H is the first quantized Hamiltonian. So it's convenient, since we like to talk about first quantization, to uh, yeah. What is that? K. Yeah, yeah. So uh, at this point, we're not discussing momentum space, but in momentum space, it would imply that K goes to minus K. Yes. Right. So at this point, this Hamiltonian, let's say, it's a matrix in on the position space lattice and it satisfies this property then and whatever comes by Fourier transforming this to Fourier space that's what it means and it means that k goes to minus k right because of a complex conjugate yeah indeed we only talk about non-interacting fermions and whatever I'll be telling you is a result that applies only to second quantized Hamiltonians of fermions, uh, which are bilinears, right? Otherwise so, well, otherwise we don't have an answer to the to up to now, right? So, so for these we have an answer, and for interacting fermion Hamiltonians, we don't have an answer. We have frac we have partial answers 
and they're sort of built out of this in a way in parts, right? Starting from a non-interacting, building upon this, right? Yeah, so uh, that's, that's good. That's a r OK, great. So, uh, so we can still do this. And it says whatever it says, right? So uh, 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 mini body, uh, ha second quantized Hamiltonian H is invariant on a time reversal if it satisfies this property. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, yeah, so, yeah, uh, uh, it, it transforms uh, annihilation operators into annihilation operators and uh, creation operators into creation operators and we leave ourselves and it has to be it anti-unitary, so if we encounter in the way some ice, we have to, or some, some complex numbers, we have to complex conjugate them. Here in this equation, there aren't any yet, but if we like to transfer, to figure out what i times the annihilation operator is, then it's actually minus i, this one, right? So, so, so that's what this means. Uh, there, we will shortly encounter another transformation where psi is mapped into psi dagger. Actually, there will be two. Uh, Other questions? What is that? Uh, at this point, uh, uh, we don't make any. We don't have any constraints on this, so it doesn't. It may be a Bogolyov Dijon Hamiltonian of a superconductor which has quote anomalous terms, psi squared and psi dagger squared, and. This also applies to these, so we don't have any uh, anything special, right? All right. It's just a convenient way of of exploiting. Of, so we want to make sure because so you know so this is just conjugating with time reversal, right? So if you look at the canonical commutators. You obviously want them to be conserved under time reversal. So the time reversed creation and time reversed annihilation operators should again satisfy canonical commutation relations. So time reversal should be a canonical transformation, right? And so then uh, if you ask how is this conveniently written, it's written in this way that here, if you want this, earlier I've written this as a column vector of operators. And this multiplies uh, from a left a unitary matrix, which for some reason by convention I called u dagger, doesn't matter. And this one is a row vector of psi daggers and multiplies from the right with a ut matrix. So it's a convenient way to just keeping track of the canonical nature of time reversal. Right? So if you do this yourself, you, you may first do the wrong thing and it doesn't look nice what you get, but if you write this way, this is you dagger and this is you. All right, other questions? So, uh, so it's convenient to restrict uh, uh, the so defined uh, second quantized time reversal operator on the first quantized Hilbert space. First quantized Hilbert space, remember, is just all those states you get from the Fock vacuum by applying creation operators. And then you get some kind of operator, which I call T, right? It, it's a first quantized version. And uh, so uh, this condition uh, in first quantization, can be written, it's again an exercise. Uh, so this uh, condition is the same as this one, uh, where uh, I don't have a star, uh, but uh, the star 
we write in the following way. So time reversal is complex conjugation uh, times a unitary matrix. And uh, the complex conjugation is just uh, k squared is 1, kh, k inverse is a h star. Uh, so so we, we, we write the fact that we write complex conjugation in operator language. So that's, of course, uh, well known from elementary quantum mechanics. That's what we always do. Uh, all right. And so, so this is the expression uh, for time reversal on the first quantized Hamiltonian, which is an n by n matrix. All right. So now we can do uh, this. We can square the so defined time reversal operator. So now square of tau. So now, obviously, if I square tau, uh, I get, uh, so I write it first in a second quantized language. Uh, so, so that, because if I square in anti-unitary operators, uh, anti unitary operator, i goes into i again, and I minus i. Uh, so is a unitary, is some unitary operator. And since I'm now using the second quantized language, it's one of those that I've denoted earlier by uh, u hat. And uh, as we discussed at that point, each such unitary operator acting on fermion creation and relation operator has an associated unitary matrix, and that matrix is U. So logic is time reversal square is some kind of unitary operator acting on Fox space. Each unitary operator acting on, uh, on fermion creation and relation operator, as defined earlier, is characterized by a unitary, op, uh, by a unitary op, uh, matrix. And now there's an exercise, uh, which I'll do in a slightly different way. Uh, so I can check that that unitary matrix is the unitary matrix appearing in the definition of time reversal times the complex conjugate of that. So maybe a quick way of understanding this is in first quantization uh, follows also from the following logic. So in first quantization, time reversal is denoted by this uh, uh, u, a unitary matrix times complex conjugation. If I square this, u time reversal k, u time reversal k. Now remember, k squares to 1, k is k inverse, ut k ut k inverse is a ut ut star. So that's another way of thinking about that. What is that? Uh, yeah, so I'll come to that. But right now, I'm thinking about uh, the first quantized version. So there is no fermion parity. It's just fixed. We just have one. Uh, yeah, right. 
Right. Right. Uh, so now, because So obviously, uh, h is invariant under the square of time reversal, and uh, this implies in first quantization uh, that the operator u t u star u t star, which implements the square of time reversal at the first quantized level that commutes uh, with H and so uh, I'd like to now argue uh, that when I act with time reversal twice, I must get the identity matrix up to a potential phase. So there's two ways of arguing this. Uh, one is uh, using this equation that u t u star is something that commutes with this Hamiltonian. But all the Hamiltonians which are time reverse invariant will do this and we will see later uh, one way or the other that this set of Hamiltonians with a set of block Hamiltonians is, is, is an irreducible space of Hamiltonians and uh, therefore by Shear's lemma uh, this must be a, a proportional to the identity. And it must be a phase because u and u dagger, u and u star are unitary, so their product must be a unitary operator. Another way of thinking about that is what we always do in quantum mechanics. We say when time reversal acts twice, a uh, state in Hilbert space should be mapped into the same Hilbert space, in the same space, but uh, into the a, a state in Hilbert space should be mapped into the same state, potentially with a phase. We want to get the same state, and so so that's this phase. So when a, so we can say make simple statements about this phase by looking at. Ut ut star ut, which we can write in two different ways. And so uh, ut ut star is a phase times ut, but ut star ut is a complex conjugate, so it gives me the complex conjugate phase. And for that reason, we can bring 
this phase to the other side of the equation. So uh, we get uh, e to the 2i gamma ut is ut. And so e to the i gamma is plus or minus 1. And so that means that t squared is ut, ut star, which must be plus or minus 1 in the first quantized description. Right? So it's probably familiar uh, quantum mechanics. So in conclusion, There's three ways uh, a Hamiltonian can respond to time reversal. Uh, so now we write, and so uh, we write t squared. So t squared is plus 1 uh, means that h is t invariant with t squared is plus identity. Minus 1 means h is t invariant with t squared is minus identity. And then it may happen that uh, h is not invariant not time reversal invariant. And then we just write simply 0. So that's where the symbols 0 plus minus 1 mean in the table. And in a table, we, always we also use some kind of uh, shorthand notation that uh, there is a letter t, and it's, it can also take. Uh, so it means actually t squared. This is a shorthand notation. All right. Uh, Finally, so, so that's uh, what we have in this table. Uh, there is an uh, entry. There's an entry t, which in this language means t squared. And it takes on three values. That's this. So I'll explain the other uh, labels uh, as we go now. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It's a time reversal operation. So it is actually coming back to the question we'll have to address uh, later. How many time reversal operators are there? And I claim there's only one uh, in some sense. In a sense, we'll, uh, de I'll describe uh, as we go. So, so remember, uh, uh, the separation uh, uh, of, of, of unitarily realized, realized symmetries out of a system, uh, out of Hamiltonians, is useful because there's a lot of them. But once we get rid of them, uh, there's only anti-unitarily realized symmetries left. And I claimed there aren't many. And so this is related to your question. So there's actually basically only one time reversal operator modulo unitarily realized ones. So that's a correct. That's a statement. And which one you you like to use in a particular application? Well, you have to choose that matrix U T suitably according to what you want to do with it. So let me 
just, uh, so I have a few minutes, so let me just write this down. So that uh, goes back to uh, earlier discussion. So when I'm the, in the situation where the first quantized time reversal operator squares to minus the identity, uh, then we can think of that in the language of a second quantized time reversal operator. And we should do that because we want to work in fermion Fox space. That's where our physical problem resides. Uh, so, then, uh, let's go back to Uh, it's action, this action of a corresponding uh, square of, a cor of this cor corresponding second quantized time reversal operator, and I claim it's this. And how do I know that? That's because uh, time reversal squared is a unitary operator, and it's uh, written in terms of some unitary matrix. And the unitary matrix is, as you expect, ut, ut star. And we just concluded uh, that's plus or minus one. So obviously, if that unitary matrix corresponding to the unity operator uh, representing uh, the square of the second quantized time reversal operator, this is the identity, then there's of course a plus sign. But if it's minus one, uh, it will be of course just minus one. And so now, uh, No, uh, no, it's 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 uh, in a priori there is no connection, right? That's because uh, this statement, and uh, I'm not sure how much uh, we have. We we probably thought about this at some point when we thought about this equation. So this is, an, uh, in a way, an inconvenient equation uh, because it's basis dependent. So how do we do this in quantum mechanics? We pick a basis set of a, 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 a basis of a Hilbert space, and then we declare that. So n is some basis of a Hilbert space, uh, and uh, then we declare that we can define. Uh, k on this basis uh, as the basis being invariant in a time reversal. Uh, and that gives me one definition of ut. Now you make a basis change. You make a unitary transformation to another basis. Uh, n twiddle, uh, whatever, n tw tilde, n tilde, and there is then another time reversal operator. And that amounts to the fact that you have to change ut. So ut is a basis dependent statement. Right. So, right. so it's somewhat inconvenient. Uh, does that answer? Yeah. Any more question? I think I have minus two minutes, so I'll wrap up in, uh, in a minute. And so now, what does this mean? 
So I knew how time reversal square, square acts on creation of an annihilation operator. But now, of course, every state in the uh, fermion Fox space can be created uh, by acting on the Fox space vacuum with some Q number uh, of, uh, of fermion creation operators. So therefore, it turns out uh, that time reversal squared is minus one to the Q, where a Q just counts the number of uh, fermions in a state, right? So that's the simple reason is because any state in the Fox space is of the f can be created uh, by acting on the vacuum with some uh, Q number of creation operators. And every time I act with a creation operator, then tau squared changes sign, right? So that's why it's, uh, and this thing here is usually called uh, the fermion number parity operator on the fermionic Fox space, all right? So are there any questions about this? So I think I'm out of time. I'm going very slow. But uh, uh, so the next time, I will complete the discussion of, of this table. So in particular, what this is, what this is, and how these things comes, come about, and how we use this uh, as a framework in which we can implement the question of topological invariance. We haven't even discussed that now, right? It's just building a framework in which we can capture all possible Hamiltonians of quantum mechanics. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I will. I will do that. That's uh, okay. Maybe okay. Maybe I spend one minute on this. Uh, so, so there is a. So, without having explained in any detail this table, you 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 should probably think that this is a kind of unexpected table because uh, of the following reason. So, so these are the time evolution operators of these blocks which you get when you mod out by all the unitarily realized symmetries. So this is a statement about quantum mechanics, right? So however, this list of things uh, is, has another meaning, has a geometrical meaning. And that meaning uh, arises from a question that is a completely different question. That's the mathematician Elie Carton. Uh, ask himself at the beginning of uh, early parts of last century. So Carton asked, uh, we know geometrically what spheres are. Spheres have the same curvature everywhere. So Carton asked, well, can I classify somehow all possible spheres? So definition of a sphere, more abstractly, is a space, is a Riemannian space, some space that has a metric, Riemannian metric, and it has a Riemann curvature tensor, which is covariantly constant on its space. So curvature is all the same. And we should only have one radius of curvature. Right? And so these are generalizations of what you might want to call spheres. And Carton, who also is the one who classified Lie algebras, uh, found the answer. Uh, and the answer is just this. So, all generalizations of spheres are precisely these things. So the statement that is kind of a surprise is that the time evolution operators in quantum mechanics, single particle quantum mechanics, which appear by looking at time, time evolutions of these block Hamiltonians, have a geometrical meaning. And their meaning is just that they're generalized spheres. So that's, uh, in a few words, the connection with Carton.
it's far from obvious that this is the case. We have to learn about uh, Carton's work, but this is a summary of it. And uh, we have to understand why the block time evolution operators are also those. And some of that hopefully I get to explain, if not fully in some way during these lectures. So which one is the ordinary sphere? The ordinary sphere is, uh, <laughs> on this chart. yeah. Uh, So it's u2 mod u1 uh, times u1. So it's also uh, isomorphic uh, to su2 uh, mod u1. Uh, that's a sphere. Uh, uh, we can discuss that later. What about a three sphere? Uh, that's a two-dimensional sphere. And uh, three spheres, you have to add some, some extra numbers. So the so 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 that is also written as uh, so three so two and uh, so it's also so this is an example uh, of uh, of this uh, entry uh, the ordinary sphere it it comes here. But it also comes uh, here. It's an example of this with suitable choices of n and m, right? And the higher dimensional spheres are just uh, S O n plus one S O n. So there's other examples of these uh, which appear here, and uh, so all kinds of uh, generalization of spheres are precisely those. And those people who have uh, studied Anderson localization, some of you may not have, but uh, so uh, there the notion of nonlinear sigma models, and these are the target spaces of nonlinear sigma models, which are also spheres of some sort, generalization of spheres. But uh, if you haven't heard about this, uh, you should ignore that comment. I'm curious, why don't you put the, um, the Hamiltonian, uh, the random matrix Hamiltonian in a color, but uh, you put this uh, time evolution operator? I'm, I'm just curious. No, I could. Yeah, and sure. it's an equivalent statement. Sure, I just sure. have to take somehow the log of these. Yeah, but I, I, I guess probably one of the answer is that because uh, orthogonal and symplectic, they do, they are different from them because the historical reason. No, no, it's 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 the I mean, same uh, it's the same amount of information. Yeah. So as I said, if if I write this unit this time evolution operator in terms of a Hamiltonian, yeah, I, then I this Hamiltonian is a Hermitian sure. matrix. Sure. In this case, as I explain as I mentioned but have not explained, mm -hmm. it's a it's a Hermitian matrix which in some basis can be made a symmetric matrix, a real symmetric yeah. matrix. I and then that then this is equivalent to, to sure. that statement. It's sure. a different, so the connection uh, with, uh, with, with uh, spheres uh -huh. is more direct okay. when I look at this, even okay. though, well, we can always translate one yeah, into the sure. other. Okay, yeah, I guess probably because of the way I learned is from the random matches. Really. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I, I know they are equivalent, I'm just right. curious. Uh, right, right. They, they also talk about this stuff, but sure. maybe it depends on who you read. Uh, they, uh, very different. Uh, yeah, I, I, I it doesn't matter. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. matter. Yeah, it's equivalent. Okay, thank you. All right. So when you're defining the basis there, you always have a U1 gate choice of finding a basis, right? So you can always take n to you know e to the power i gamma times n, and you're basically saying that I choose this one and call this real in some. Indeed, place. indeed. Right. I make a certain basis. Uh, I call this real, and I want to yeah. call another basis real. I have to yeah. redefine so, things. So, 
So in a sense, it seems really artificial to, you know, write down that, you know, your K makes I go to minus I, like to really think of it as a complex conjugation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you can think of multiplying by I as an automorphism with squares to minus one. So right. Is there a purely algebraic way of thinking about it? Yeah, there is a better way, and this is uh, more mathematical. But uh, you, so you may not like this, but uh, so if, if I... If I have time now, the way I'm going, I may not be able to really go through this. But uh, so, if you think about uh, the first quantized Hamiltonian, which is some n by n matrix, normally in quantum mechanics we think about this matrix as a matrix made of a complex number entries. Uh, but it turns out that any complex number. Uh, you can write uh, as x plus i y, obviously. So every complex number, so the, the space of complex numbers is really a two-dimensional real space, right? And uh, so you can write it as x times the identity uh, plus uh, y times zero, uh, which is yeah. the poly matrix, whatever i sigma y or maybe plus or minus, I forgot, right? So, so you can think about it as a two-dimensional matrix. And this matrix is a matrix that has real entries, yeah. right? So, so it's a matrix that has whatever x, x, y, minus y. So, and of course, if you multiply, because the identity and this matrix, they commute, obviously, right? Yeah. So everything you do in terms of multiplication, algebraic operations in a field so of complex number, real it's a real representation. Okay. So, so if you choose, so the n by n complex number matrix can be thought of as a 2n by 2n real number matrix. Yeah. And then complex conjugation i appears as a matrix which is basically this one tensor with whatever uh, identity, right? Uh, and so it's more convenient uh, in a real basis uh, to think about... Uh, so then you can abstract away and say this is just some matrix that's squared minus right, one right, without right, it out. Right, right, so, right. So that's actually a way we use... Uh, uh, so there's a way to derive this and the topological classification uh, by, uh, by using uh, Clifford algebras which is uh, something that originally Alexei Kitaev brought up. And, uh, and it ultimately relies on some result in mathematics, uh, which is... Uh, the backwards way of doing this, where you start with these groups and you add things which anti-commute to everything else, right? Yeah, so, that, so uh, if I have time, I'll do this. I'm not sure if I have time to de r derive this kind of thing yeah, from that way. It was actually Mike Stone who did that. And I worked what with is that? It was Mike Stone who wrote. Yeah, yeah. so Mike so explained so it in this yeah. way, so right? I, I work with him, so I... Oh, you work with him. Okay, excellent. So I've seen yeah, so you, I'm not telling you anything new then. Okay. But, right. but yeah, I mean, this I thing was, it's, it's never clarified really, like, yeah. this is really a basic choice. It's it's well, okay, so when you take my quantum mechanics class, you probably learned it. <laughs> but, uh, so I guess uh, some, you know, uh, Sakurai does a reasonable job in okay. explaining that, but it's elementary quantum. It goes to back to Wigner, so Wigner knew this. It's really hard in Kenneth's matter to actually clarify this, like no one, they just say, okay, this is a, you know, that's yeah. what she does and indeed, indeed. you gotta take it on fate. Indeed. So and we will elaborate on this because we have another operator like this, which is the C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's also can be thought of as uh, anti unitary and okay. it's another one of these. And it behaves very similarly. Right. So but you work with uh, Mike so you know everything.